I love advanced applications of ultrasounds. We're talking critical care stuff, advanced echo, advanced procedures like nerve blocks, or really difficult IV access. But one thing that I've been super excited about recently was musculoskeletal ultrasound. Now I've always liked it, but the more I actually look into the literature and the more I start using it, I realize that even in the emergency department, that knowing how to adequately perform, how to interpret and how to act on the results of your bedside ultrasound when it comes to musculoskeletal complaints is huge. I've actually had quite a few orthopedic injuries myself and being the person who gets the x-ray and the, I don't know, follow up with somebody else outpatient can be kind of frustrating. So being able to more efficiently diagnose and manage these patients with usually non-life-threatening things still can affect patients' lives. And if you just base it off of the chief complaint, arguably it'll affect more patients than diagnosing that patient with life-threatening pericardial tamponade, for instance, which I'm not saying don't diagnose that. I mean, definitely diagnose that. It's just those are less common than a knee pain that you might diagnose a lateral meniscus tear, for instance. Now, one of the things that I'm not sure why we in emergency medicine don't do more of is arthrocentesis and knee injections. So I did a little bit of research and turns out we can do them. I've actually been doing quite a few of these in the emergency department where I work and I love doing them. I know you can probably do a lot of these in your landmark guidance, but even in the ones that look like they would be really easy, I still find myself doing a little bit worse when I don't use that ultrasound guidance. So I try to use them every single time. Check out this video on joints. We cover the knee, the hip, and the shoulder um, identification of effusions as well as um, injections, um, which basically are the same thing. Just one of them you're pushing stuff in, the other one you're pushing or pulling stuff out. I will be publishing more content specifically on MSK. I'm gonna target the other joints in the upcoming lecture, so stay tuned for that. Without any further ado, check out the video. So what we're gonna talk about here is joint effusions and arthrocentesis. I do want to tell everybody that I basically was like, I was like, please, I really want Lauren to ask me to do this, please. And I didn't wanna be uh, like pressure her to it. And she was just like, hey, do you have any slides? And I was like trying to be like calm. And I was like, yeah, I have some slides. Do you want them? Or do you like want me to like, you know? And then it like evolved into like a, a talk. So I'm like super excited um, that I get to do this. Um, it's not super rehearsed. So if I kind of mess up, I'm sorry. So our objectives today are gonna be, we're gonna talk about these three main joints. I do have a bonus section at the end if we end up having enough time, but we're gonna talk about aspirations, injections, and identification. Now, I think that there's not a huge difference between between injection and aspirations. And actually we were talking about in the front row here, how if we have time, I think that uh, you know on shift and we're able to do it, I'm not sure why as ER doctors we don't do injections for like arthritis pain. I'm not sure why we don't. Like we do uh, pain control, we give uh, parenteral uh, uh, opiates for this um, you know, with alacrity, but why not actually inject where the problem actually is? I feel like there's probably less likely to have side effects and technique, it's very similar. I just think injecting might be a little bit harder because you don't have as big of a like thing to, to aim for. Whereas in effusion, you have like a big old like, you know, uh, pocket of fluid to aim for. So um, this is something that I've started to do in my clinical practice. I think I've done two or three so far injections. Um, and if we're ever on a patient and we have it, we have the time, let's do it. All right, we'll learn together. All right, we'll start off with the shoulder because it's probably the most common evaluation. Um, this is your uh, pro placement, and you want to basically find the scapular spine, which separates the supra uh, spinatus with the infraspinatus. Find the scapular spine and then just go out laterally. You can use the linear probe or the curvilinear probe. I actually like the curvilinear probe better. It gives me a little bit wider of a field of view. I think I can see a little bit better. Now, for visualization of how the ultrasound looks, I like to think about it as how the ultrasound is actually looking at it, right? Um, so this is basically the view. You're getting a transverse cut of that posterior shoulder, and you're basically placing the transducer right here to get this image. And most of the time what we're doing is we're actually doing this to look for a dislocation. That's honestly like the most common uh, way to do it. So this is the actual probe placement here. And you see how I'm, I'm basically on the arm. Like the joint, the, the separation between the humeral head and the glenoid, the middle of that is where you actually want your transducer. So it's actually quite, to me, a little more lateral than I might have thought. 
here is that image again, and here's everything labeled. Is everybody okay with that and how it looks? Great. Now, this right here, this is the humeral head. Um, it is basically, if you just kind of like draw like a little like line, you see that these are connected, right? This is what a dislocation looks like. So this is that same glenoid. That is the humerus. Right? And then this uh, infraspinatus is like pulled all the way down here and this hyperechoic kind of mixed echo texture in here, that is a clot in the joint. It's blood basically. Now, why is it like deep? Like why is it not like out this way if it's a dislocation? Why does it like look deep compared yeah, to like Brilliant, because it's anterior, right? It's because with the pro placement, it's away from the transducer. So to the transducer, it's deep to it, which it is. But think, this is actually an anterior one. Um, I don't have it in here, but there's also a, uh, Mike actually uh, shared with me a really good clip of a posterior dislocation. So a posterior dislocation, you'll just have, um, the humerus will be closer to your transducer. It'll be more superficial relative to your transducer. This is actually, uh, we were recording a tutorial um, on this guy who is like a climber, and we were just ultrasounding it, and we found an actual effusion. He's like, oh yeah, my shoulder hurts most of the time because of climbing, and we're like, oh, you have a reactive effusion in there. So this is what an effusion looks like. Here's a slightly better view of this. So it's basically this pocket of fluid right here. Sometimes, like not for ones this big, this is the glenoid, by the way, right here. Um, not for ones this big, but sometimes what I'll do, and that's what I was doing at the beginning of the clip, is I'll, if I'm not sure if something is like a bit of cartilage or a bursa, I'll actually compress a little bit. And you saw how it was kind of squishy, like I was able to actually compress it. So cartilage um, will not obviously do that, but I will say like that's too big of a strip for it to be cartilage. It's used. Cartilage is like a millimeter maybe right on the end of that joint. Any questions on shoulders about how to diagnose effusions versus uh, dislocations? Steel? Okay, we're going to go back just a little bit on your slide. Um, so on the clip or this way? Uh, for the anatomy on the ocean. This one? No, oh. Okay, good, good. Here. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we've had a couple of times, Mike and I, we had a <coughs> Somebody that looked like they're dislocated, mm -hmm. and it was a you know frail little old lady, and it looked dislocated, and I was pulling on it, and then he came in, we ultrasounded her, and she actually had that effusion and bleeding inside the joint, so it caused it to sublock, right. and it wasn't a dislocation. So you weren't you can have both, that thing in. right? You can. I mean, you always can try aspirating and then pushing but it back the, in. The yeah. ultrasound picked it up. The X-ray um, obviously didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of. But you'll see that sometimes. So I, I would, I would agree. You should have ultrasound some of these, especially if you're having trouble getting it in. Sure. Wait, you did. <laughs> Ten points to your house. Oh, me too. That's great. Yes. Twenty points then. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments on the shoulder? We're going to do actual injections later because I'm doing spaced repetition. I'm going to take a brief pause here just to let you know that all of our content is on the coreultrasound.com website. That is Ultrasound Podcast, 5 Minutes Sono, Ultrasound of the Week, Clip Bank. And we also have our courses page where we have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals and Core Ultrasound Question Bank, where you have 3,200 questions with feedback, including narrated videos explaining the question. Check it out and back to your video. All right, moving on to knee. Probably the most common effusion that we're gonna look at. This is the kind of sac, like the where fluid can be. Um, it extends quite a bit uh, cephalat, right? It's not just like right here in this area. It extends all the way underneath the patella. I usually start off by looking at the suprapatellar region um, for an effusion. It's the most common location. And if they have their knee, um, uh, yeah, if they have their knee extended, often the fluid is going to like, you're only going to see it in that uh, location. Anybody recognize this leg? <laughs> recognize this leg? Yeah, Chris, do you recognize this leg? This is Chris's leg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> All right, so this is what it looks like right here. This was the intern boot camp either this year or last year. Remember when I like, yeah, okay. He's like, 
I do. I, it was coerced. Um, <laughs> so these are your anatomy right here. We have the probe marker up. So left side of the screen, I have it cephalad here, caught at over here. Um, the quad tendon is uh, one of the more, it's, I would say it's the most important landmark for knowing if this is an effusion or not. Anything deep to the quad tendon is a knee effusion. Even if it's like up here, remember that bursa comes all the way out of here, that joint sac comes all the way out of here. So even this would be an effusion. We have the patella over here, femur, and then this is the actual joint right here. You can also look inferiorly as well. Um, same view, probe marker facing up uh, towards the patient's head. I really like this view because uh, uh, this particular individual has a, a super strong patellar tendon. Maybe the best patellar tendon I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 very good. Yeah, yeah. Avila said I have a strong patellar tendon on a CV. Um, that's on a, that's on awards actually. It's an award. Um, all right. So are we good with this anatomy down here, right? Now, what's interesting to me is this. I hadn't really thought about this. I I know anatomy so much better now after like doing all this ultrasound stuff. The femur extends with the, when the foot is out. Like I said, the femur actually goes lower than the patella. I actually didn't know that. You know, you kind of feel like the patella is always right in the middle of the joint, but it isn't. The joint is usually a little bit lower than the patella, especially with the knee uh, flexed. Um, so there's an infrapatellar fat pad right here. It has an eponym, but we don't use those anymore. Um, and this is where we would look for effusion here. For infection, I have never so far seen just an infrapatellar effusion. It's always suprapatellar, and then I also see some infrapatellar. For traumatic effusions, I have seen them more in the infrapatellar region, especially when they have a uh, tibial plateau fracture. Cool? Oh, you guys see that right there, the little black, right at the end of that uh, femur? That was, that's the appearance of cartilage, actually. So you see how there's like a little layer of black right on top? So that's cartilage, okay? So if, you, if you're ever not sure, what you can do is actually compress. And if it doesn't compress, then it's cartilage. Now, what do you make of this right here? What is that? It's fluid. Is it? A, it's a bursa. That's right. It's a bursa. So uh, Chris, as far as I know, didn't have any pain in this area. Um, and there is basically around joints, there's always going to be little kind of sacs of fluid um, that are there because they're supposed to, right? They're supposed to be there. What I do if I'm not sure if something is pathologic or not, it's kind of cool with everything MSK, you have a control. So if Chris was a patient that came with knee pain, I see this just in the infrapatellar area, I would look on the contralateral unaffected side. And if he has something similar, it's physiologic. It's very likely physiologic. We good with the difference? So uh, here in a, what is that? I just, it's a hashtag, but it's a pound sign. Thank you. Um, uh, pound sign here, pound sign here. Do you guys know what these are? They're normal things that are in joints all the time. It's a little bit of fat. There's always little chunks of fat in there. I don't know why. Probably somebody smarter than me could tell me like why we have fat in there, but we always have fat in there. So those little uh, hyperechoic little things that are attached to the femur um, and to the underneath area of the quad tendon, um, those are just fat pads normal. This is my knee, you guys. It was after I had my, uh, finally my meniscus uh, surgery for my meniscus tear. Um, and the orthopedic surgeon was like, yeah, you can do whatever you want. I was like, okay. So I got on my, uh, my bike for like 30 minutes, like the day after surgery. And this was my knee after that bike. I shouldn't have done that. But that's what an effusion looks like. Now, one thing is that it's a very dynamic examination, right? This is uh, my good knee. I'm just flexing it and extending it. This is flexed and this is, sorry, that's flexed. And then when it goes back down, that's with it extended. Uh, the best way to actually measure this or the standardized way is with the knee in about 30 degrees flexion. That's the best thing. Sometimes patients can't do it, so you may do it with what you got. But 30 degrees flexion is usually the most sensitive approach to look for. Effusion? Yeah, I think so, right? That's a good effusion. See those two uh, fat pads there? Pretty normal. Okay, so an effusion, yeah. Now, what's different about this one? Yeah. So, well, I can compress it, right? So I was like, you see how it's like it's squishing? Yeah. And you can see the little hypercoke little things on the inside. Um, this is uh, an exudative effusion, right? So this could be something. And the setting of uh, trauma, which this was, 
more likely to be clot. Um, in the setting of a possible infection, more likely to be an infection, right? Um, there is no data that shows that, you know, this is specific for an extra day, but it makes sense. And every time I've seen this, it's always been gooey, you know, either blood or pus. Now, what's going on here? Why does it look like this? It's super weird. This is also, this is uh, femur down here. Um, quad tendon, just trust me, it's up here somewhere. This is supra patellar. Mm -hmm. Why does it look like this? I'll tell you it's a setting. So we have bone down here, right? So no hardware. Um, this is a fat pad. So this is in the setting of trauma. This is lipohemarthrosis. Yeah, so when you see like, a, like layers, yeah. it's usually because there's oil in there too, oil being uh, fat from the uh, joint itself, from the bone, sorry, marrow. Isn't it cool? It's like, it's like great layered. I, I probably, like I have to think about it. I feel like this is probably fat, like marrow. This is probably fresh blood and that's probably like clotted blood, probably, if I think about it. Because oil usually goes up, so um, cool. Any questions on knees? Hip. Now this is another thing that I like didn't really know it until I did ultrasound. The capsule, the uh, hip capsule extends from the tab all the way to the greater trochanter. So it's not just the head of the femur that we're looking at. We actually want to look at the entire neck of the femur. Now, this is another thing, too, with the angle. We have the femur that goes up, and then it's like a, whatever, a 30 degree or 45 degree or whatever angle to get into it. So your pro placement is not going to be like straight up and down. It's actually going to be tilted this way a bit. All right? So you notice here I have the curvilinear transducer, which is what I like for the hip because it's usually a bit deeper. And what I usually do is I'll track the femur up. And then as soon as I get to what I think is the end, then I tilt the transducer so I can see the head and the neck. Now, remember that there is usually a small bit of fluid in there because like you need that kind of like lubrication in, in a joint. Um, and you can always compare the contralateral side if you need to. All right, we good with this right here? We got the head right here, neck right here. This whole thing is capsule. Okay, so you got to look all, all here. And in fact, most of the time, you're more likely going to see the effusion down here rather than all the way up here most of the time. And these are you know, some muscles up there. All right, now let's look at abnormal effusion, right? You notice it's mostly over the neck. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you have it kind of tilted and you can actually see the neck itself. Because the capsule extends all the way. It actually, you can actually see it connecting down here. Um, this right here is the uh, trochanter, uh, uh, one of the trochanters, probably the lesser trochanter. Anterior trochanter? Anyways, the, <laughs> I don't really know ortho. I'm, I'm like fumbling myself around here. Um, so this is all the capsule look here. Now this is another example where I actually saw it more in the head. This is actually a pediatric patient. You can see here that there's a bit of a growth plate right there. And you can see this is more kind of up here. So you still have to do a full evaluation, look at the head, look at the neck, but make sure that you look at both. Now with numbers here, um, these are uh, the most up-to-date numbers. You have a five millimeter absolute difference, like absolute size, and you just measure the, uh, the thickness with your calipers, um, or a two millimeter difference uh, between both sides. In adults, it's pretty similar, just kind of bigger spread of numbers. Seven millimeters or a one millimeter difference on either side. Good with that? It's a little different for prosthetics. So just, th I don't know why they pick 3.2, it's probably just a statistic thing, but 3.2 for prosthetics, so it's a little different for prosthetics. You can look this up. My favorite website to look up ortho stuff is a website called Ortho Bullets. I'm sure there's like a better website now, but that's the one that I've used since I was a resident, and it usually has this information on there. Any questions on that? Sweet. All right, let's move on to the fun stuff, the arthrocentesis. Um, it was already kind of talked about in that MRAP uh, kind of lecture, but if you're doing the ultrasound stuff, um, these are the things that I use. Um, it, I actually talked to some family medicine people and they don't always, they're not always sterile. Um, I, when I do these, when I basically do anything deeper than like, like lidocaine, I usually am just for, for the sake of just doing what I believe is the right thing for the patient, I usually am like, I don't wear a gown, but I use the blue towels, I use the sterile transducer cover, I have my gloves, everything is sterile basically as touching the patient. The reason I really like using the towels, and I'll get a whole pack, is because you actually have like space now, right? Um, if you have the blue towels and you have like space on the bed, um, you actually are able to like put the transducer kind of like on the bed, you have like a whole area to look at. So that's why I use the blue towels, I love the blue towels. 
With regards to probes for arthrocentesis, usually the right one is gonna be the linear transducer. It has the highest frequency, which means it gives you the best resolution image. It doesn't go deep though, so if you have a kind of a fluffier patient uh, with a hip, for instance, you'll probably need to use the curvilinear transducer to actually make it down that far to get to it. So hips, usually the curvilinear, but all other joints, I'm usually doing the linear transducer to do the actual procedure. With uh, your equipment, uh, depending on the size uh, and you know how deep it is, um, you can use just our injection needles. With ultrasound, it's always better to use a bigger needle, honestly. And if it's supier, it's you know you're it's going to be very difficult to aspirate pus out of a 27 gauge, right? It's going to take forever if you're even able to get anything. So I usually go at around 20 gauge uh, when I'm doing them. If uh, it looks like it's going to be a very large volume, I might go all the way to an 18 gauge. But usually 20 gauge is what I use. You can also use a spinal needle. Um, honestly, most of the time, if I'm doing a uh, uh, knee, a hip, a knee or a hip, I'm going to be using the spinal needle. For the other ones, I might actually just use the injection needle because you know you can get like a one and a half inch 20 gauge. Um, but if you have to go further than that, you know we have all three and a half inches for the um, the spinal needles. Any uh, questions or thoughts on the equipment needles? Sweet. All right, with the knee your placement, and remember, this is not like if you're doing it different than this, you're doing harm, it's just this is the most common approach. Most of the time you're gonna do this with the transducer on top, anterior, um, just um, proximal to the patella, and then your needle is gonna come in this way, from a lateral to medial approach in the suprapatellar region. Your positioning is gonna be basically like this. Now, if you look at it, you wanna make sure that your machine, as much as you can, is kind of like line of sight. Um, and this could be uh, at the feet, you could have this on the other side of the patient. Just have it line of sight so you can see well what you're doing. Most of the time for me, I'm actually placing on the contralateral side of the patient. Um, because I have, you know, the patient's laying down this way, um, the knees here, I have my probe here, I have my needle here, and I have the machine right in front of me. Um, so that's usually my placement of the actual machine. Um, this is one uh, that I did in, I feel like it was fellowship. Um, I'm using, uh, this one was not septic. The patient just had um, uh, kind of an arthritis type effusion. Um, and really like, I was like, I don't really want to drain this. And he was like, I want it drained. I've had it drained before. I was like, all right. Um, they also were very persistent, but also were uh, seemed to have a uh, poor stress management techniques in their mind. So a high pain uh, constituent there. And so what I did is I actually use a 27 gauge needle on this one and I actually had a little bit of trouble angling. Because remember, once you get that 27 gauge in tissue, you can try and move it all you want, but the tip doesn't really move all that well. Um, so notice here I'm full sterile in this situation actually, no, this is a, a COVID gown, Never mind, because it's during COVID. Um, you can see the needle, I'm gonna bring it in from the uh, inferior kind of perspective right there, see it? And I came a little too high, so I'm trying to re-angle it so that I'm not like aiming more anterior. And you can see here, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my needle visualization because I'm using such a small needle. But you can see it here, I'm entering into the joint space right here. Everybody good with that? Were you able to aspirate mm -hmm. out? Yeah, yeah, because it was just like synovial fluid basically. Got it. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you that now having done a, quite a few more of these, I almost invariably am gonna do 20 gauge instead of a 27. This was a very large one actually. Um, and you can also do this, uh, you know, this is just an example of doing it via a different approach. You don't have to go that approach. We have this like super small, and we have one with our sonocyte here, that kind of really small one. And you can definitely come at it from a lateral approach as well in plane. You guys see this right here? Huge, right? And this is one of those situations where like in this specific case, I probably didn't, I probably would have been fine not using the ultrasound, honestly. Um, but uh, from my perspective, even having done uh, quite a few of these from my perspective, if I can use a thing that I can just go straight into it without having to dig around, I usually end up doing it. Every time that I'm like, oh, I can do it, I'm fine, I'm, I can handle it. it, I don't know, but I feel like it causes more pain and I have to dig around a little bit sometimes to get to the pocket, even if it looks big. So I usually use ultrasound. You guys good with that right there? You'll tip. Sweet. Uh, so here's another one. Uh, this is a the normal knee or non-effusion knee. You guys see that bit of effusion right there? So we're bringing it sideways over here. Now, I have this in here because at the very beginning, do you guys see the effusion at all? No. So what happens is, um, put my knee up here. All right. 
So I actually, um, I played hockey all weekend. I went to Minnesota and I played like seven hockey games having not played hockey for a year and a half. Um, and so I was quite sore and then I did Pilates a day afterwards and that was fun. So I'm very sore. Um, so what often happens is, pretend this is lateral over here, is you have the probe here and your needle's all the way out here, right? So you can't see it. So most of the time what I end up doing is I will actually bring the needle or the transducer over to where I'm doing the skin puncture, do the skin puncture and then track it getting into that joint uh, cavity. It's specifically with the knee. So that's why you can't really see the joint uh, effusion very well. It's because I have it out laterally to find it and then basically like lead it over to the effusion that we now see. Does that make sense? Yeah. And notice how much brighter this needle is, right? I'm using a 20 gauge here versus the 27 in the other, um, the other um, examples. So I think it's much easier to use. There's a little bit of um, fat in the joint that I'm trying to get through. And sometimes it's a little tricky to get through it. Um, with this, I usually do a similar approach that I do for paras, is I'll poke the skin and then either lift it, like once the needle's uh, tip is in the skin, either lift it or lower it um, so that there's a bit of a curve when I bring it out to help close it. It wasn't a big effusion, but it was there here. Uh, it was there, and there's just another example of the same. I'll skip that. Um, this is uh, injections that I usually do. Um, after, honestly, I'll, I'll aspirate, and then I'll put a little bit of lidocaine in there. It's the same thing. You identify it in here, and you'll see these bubbles here. Um, you see those bubbles right there? That's me just injecting lidocaine into the joints. Um, and here's another example here. We'll bring that needle right in here. This is a smaller gauge here. That's why it's harder to see. And you'll see here, I'll just inject. So it's, this is for all joints. The technique is quite similar with aspiration versus injection. It's just, are you aspirating or are you injecting? Everybody good with knee? Sick. All right, moving on to shoulder. The probe placement is going to be identical, basically, to probe placement for identification. It's right here. With regards to your approach, you can definitely come at it in the short axis. I have it coming from top to bottom, but really it's more of a, like, oblique down this way to get to it and you can come at it laterally. I come at it uh, in the short axis when there's a small bit of effusion or if I'm injecting into the joint. And then I come out laterally usually for dislocations. If I'm gonna do an intraarticular injection for a dislocation because the um, humerus is actually like out of the way. So it's actually kind of easy to come at it in the long axis. Whereas if you do long axis and the joint's in place, the humeral head kind of gets in the way sometimes actually because you have to like almost like get around it to get into that joint space. So this is a short axis approach. I have the humeral head here, glenoid here. And you see right there, I have that needle tip and I'm pushing anesthetic in there. See how it's joint spacing like a little bit bigger? Cool, yeah, needle tip, there we go. And this is a more long axis approach. You guys see the needle right here? This is a dislocated humerus and I'm injecting directly into that joint to do that relocation. Everybody good with that? This one was a, it was a long spinal needle. I don't remember what gauge it was, but it was a long spinal needle. I can see the movement of the needle, mm -hmm. but it's not linear. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, you're right. And so what you can do if you're having trouble with needle identification in general is don't move it side to side or up and down. Just, and the same thing with ultrasound guided IVs, you basically bounce it a little bit. And you can honestly, you can see that movement. The reason you don't go lateral is because if you happen, let's say, you happen to be near a, a structure, like for an IV, for instance, um, or an art line, and you happen to, you don't want to like slice through things uh, if you go laterally. So that's why I bounce it. If you bounce it, you've already gone through that tissue already, and you've already like not caused significant pain. So it's unlikely that you're going to cause any damage to training areas that way. Um, the other thing too is that sometimes what I'll do, if I, I still sometimes don't get great needle visualization, but if I have the transducer, I see that, that the joint is there and I know my needle is in line, like I'm looking at it and I know my needle is in line, even if I don't have great visualization, sometimes I'll just kind of push it because I know that's around the right area and then aspirate as I go down, even if I don't have great visualization. It's almost like I'm using it as a guide in that sense rather than a, a direct visualization, like a trajectory. Yes, Macy. Uh, how many cc's are you injecting into a shoulder, say you were going to do a... Arthritis. With, like a reduction or something? Mm -hmm. First, like a knee. Because they're different size joints in theory, so would you put a smaller amount in the shoulder or... That's a good question. Um, like how much do you put in? Um, I would honestly like look that up and it depends on what you're using it for, right? So if you're doing it, let's say they have a dislocation um, and you're doing it to like help with pain after the dislocation or, you know, to help with the thing, I usually put in like a solid 
10 cc's. Like I put in a good amount, but if it gets to the point where like it's getting harder to push or it's already very full, I might not. But around 10-ish cc's is what I'll usually do. For arthritis, um, what you can do is, and I had to look this up too, is you can give uh, 20 to 40 milligrams of triamcinolone, which is usually in one cc, and then like two to four cc's of lidocaine. You can put that on there as well. So it's a much smaller amount if they don't already have pathology in that joint. Because remember when they have pathology, the joint is already like, has kind of stretched a little bit. You can put a little bit more. Do any of the back row have any uh, disagreements on amount? I like the train so long. Um, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, it can sometimes precipitate with your pivot cane. And so you just have to be careful, like look at it and sometimes you have to shake it and then it'll, it'll cause it to, or you do two injections. But generally that's a, a case of you're not using quite enough your pivot cane and, and a lot steroid or, or something like that. Are you aware of any from the uh, literature? So bupivacaine causes precipitation sometimes. Um, what about with lidocaine? Because I haven't seen anything with precipitation with lidocaine. Okay. Yeah, so if curious, just lidocaine. All right. Hip. Remember, this whole thing is the capsule. With regards to placement, place your transducer here. And this is usually done in the long axis. So this is going to be your approach. And for this one, you definitely need the longer needle. You definitely need like a three and a half, unless it's like a... a newborn right uh, but most of the time it's going to be a, a pretty like even the three and a half sometimes you might struggle getting to the joint space especially if they're a bit on the fluffy side now this one specifically there is a quite important extra thing you always got to keep in mind do you guys remember the circumflex artery from like med school you guys remember? i don't know it's a big deal right um it's it can like cause the hip to die basically so it's it's a big deal like you don't want to lacerate this right so what you can do is you can just uh before you do an injection just put color flow in that area and if you see a little pulsatile circly thing that's an artery and it doesn't like mean don't do it it just means that make sure you know where it is and don't go through it right so this is the one joint where you'll you should probably do that in all cases but this is a, a pretty important artery that you want to make sure not to go through this is an example of one. Effusion, yeah? You see the needle come in? And this is one of those situations, Katie, where I don't have great needle visual visualization on this one, but I'm able to see parts of it. I know that I'm lined up, and I see the tip right there, so it's good. Do you guys want to see the before and after, like what the aspirate looked like? I love these. Yeah. They see. Yeah, this is an IV drug user. All right. Yeah, it was gross. They got admitted. Okay, uh, quick bonus section. I wasn't sure if I'd have enough time. Just uh, ankles, right? We diagnose this uh, usually placing it um, a probe marker facing up in the sagittal orientation. Here are our landmarks. We're looking at the tibio taylor like kind of region basically. And notice that there is a bit of kind of hypoechoic right here on the end of the uh, talus. Um, if I compress this, it would show non-compressibility cartilage. Oh, can you go back to that picture? That's actually a great picture that people often forget positioning wise, right? When you're trying to define your landmarks in the ankle, having them point that toe mm. down opens the space more. So if you're doing a landmark based approach, you have them flex the great toe and then you can track your, your tendon and get in between. Um, and then, but don't forget to then have them point the toe to open the joint. Brilliant. Thanks, Whitney. You guys ready for this? This is one of my favorite ultrasounds of all time. This is squishy. This is the joint. This is the uh, an, uh, anterior tibial tendon right here. This is the joint. And you can see, this is an IV drug user. Um, you can see squishiness up here and squishiness down here. This uh, patient uh, went to the OR, obviously. Where were they shooting? Huh? I think it was their feet. Yeah, I think. Uh, here's, a, I guess, a more traditional one. Um, this is actually showing a tap right here. Um, so joint space, tap. Um, here's an example of doing one. Now, this is in the long axis, but I usually now will actually do them in the short axis. So I'll have uh, relative to the joint. So similar to the knee, identify it in the sagittal orientation, then turn the probe into a more transverse cut, and then come in laterally. Um, but this is a way that you can do it as well. This right here, by the way, is not cellulitis. I had anesthetized the area. That's uh, anesthetic. 
and you see that joint going right in, or that needle going right into that uh, relatively small joint space. You can also do this from on top, so you have the probe transverse. You can also go in straight down if you need to. Cool beans? I also did an elbow and a wrist, but we'll talk about that later, just so that we can get done on time. Now, I didn't mention it all the way at the beginning, but this uh, lecture was obviously given to our residents at the SoCal uh, UHS SoCal EM residency in Temecula, California. If you want to know more about that residency, just reach out. Myself, Mike Macias, and two other ultrasound trained faculty are there. We do a bunch of ultrasounds there. Um, it was really fun to give this lecture. I'm really interested in hearing what you all think. I hope to hear from you soon, and happy scanning.